Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AMR Action Podcast. My name is Danny Peters, and I'm the Senior Advisor to the Canadian Antimicrobial Innovation Coalition. And I'm very pleased to welcome our guest, uh, Dr. Stephanie Strathy, as part of our special podcast marking World Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week. Uh, Stephanie is an infectious disease epidemiologist and associate dean of global health sciences and professor and, uh, and Harold Simon chair at UC San Diego's School of Medicine. She also directs the UCSD Center for Innovative Age Application and Therapeutics and is adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins and Simon Fraser Universities. She was named one of Time's 50 Most Influential People in Healthcare. We are so glad to have you here today. Um, as, as a Canadian, but also Canadian in the United States, and, and we, we like marking um, a bilateral relationship we have and how we need to work together on AMR. So, so Stephanie, you and your husband, uh, physio, uh, psychologist Tom Patterson, were on vacation in Egypt when Tom came down with a stomach bug, and um, it was not uh, food poisoning, of course, and this led you down a, a difficult but also an inspiring path. And I, I'd like to ask you to share your story, uh, story of your husband, Tom Patterson, in the case of Iraqi Bacter, and how this led you to um, phage therapy. So, Well, thanks so much for having me today, Danny. And uh, it's it's uh, nice to be surrounded by someone who has my own Canadian accent. Um, <laughs> and I say out and about, everybody knows where I'm from, and I'm a flag-waving Canadian. So... Um, you know, this story really was is one about where my personal and professional lives collided in a pretty um, spectacular way. My husband and I were on a vacation in Egypt in 2015 over American Thanksgiving. And to me, he looked like he was in perfect health. He was just overweight. And he was like climbing backwards down into a pyramid and, you know, just hamming it up at the Cairo um, Museum and seemed to be fine. But then a couple of days later, we had had this wonderful meal on top of a cruise ship and, um, you know, he got violently ill and uh, he couldn't keep anything down. He was vomiting all night long. His stomach was distended. Uh, I called a doctor to the ship. He gave him some antibiotics and said, oh, he'll be right as rain in a couple hours. And he wasn't. He was worse. And in fact, um, he then started complaining about back pain. Well, I'm not a physician, but I, uh, you don't have to be a a physician to know that that's not a sign of food poisoning and so the doctor was called back he said oh your husband's going into shock by then so was I and um, you know there was no hospital we were based in Luxor we were supposed to see the Valley of the Kings the next day mm -hmm. and um, I thought for a minute there that my husband was going to see the Valley of the Kings you know feet first in his own tomb and I was joking about it because I just didn't think that it was that serious um and then all of a sudden it, it turned serious very quickly. So um, they diagnosed him with pancreatitis, which is an inflammation of the pancreas. And we learned it was caused by a gallstone that had lodged in his bile duct and that that can cause complications. So we got him medevaced uh, first to Germany and then back home to San Diego. And uh, by then it was determined that the, this uh, gallstone had caused an abscess to form inside his abdomen. This was the size of a small soccer ball. And inside it was something was growing and lurking. And it turned out to be one of the most deadliest superbugs on the planet. It's called Acinetobacter bomanii. Um, it's got the unfortunate nickname of Arachobacter because so many veterans um, in the Middle East acquired this organism when they were um, you know, victims of implosive um, IEDs. So, um, and their, the bomb blasts you know, embedded the shrapnel in their skin. And so many of them recovered from their bomb blast, but died of, of Acinetobacter bomanii. So it's a very deadly pathogen and that was, was what was taking my husband down and so um i you know thought this is god's cruel joke i mean i'm trained as an infectious disease epidemiologist did my training at the university of toronto and yet i was blindsided by the fact that amr has become a global crisis and that an organism that you acquire on a vacation can turn into something that can almost kill you. And there were no antibiotics left that could treat this thing. It was resistant to everything. So um, the doctors were actually my friends here uh, in San Diego that were caring for him. And they said, you know, there's nothing we can do. Like, 
He's too weak for surgery. If we operate, um, this organism could get into his bloodstream. He would get sepsis and die. So I did my own homework. I went home and I started doing research on alternative treatments for multidrug resistant organisms. And I stumbled across something that rang a bell. Now, here's where I was really glad that I went to the University of Toronto and I took virology because um, there's an organism called a phage, short for bacteriophage. And these are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. And they were discovered over 100 years ago by a French Canadian scientist, Felix de Harel. And um, they were used to treat bacterial infections in animals and in people for a couple of decades. And then they fell out of favor when penicillin came on the scene. And also, because the former Soviet Union really um, em em um, embraced phage therapy and that was seen as Soviet science and they're the enemy. So that geopolitical bias is really, you know, hung over the field for a long time. So uh, I was able to get uh, a global network of total strangers and uh, also my colleagues at the University of California, San Diego, who agreed that if we could find phage that were a match for Tom's bacterial isolate, that they would um, reach out to the FDA and get permission to give it to them because it's considered experimental treatment in the US and in Canada. And we did it. Um, within three weeks, we had sourced phages directly from crazy places like sewage and the bilges of ships because the US Navy got involved and um, we injected them into his body. Uh, it was the scariest thought that you're going to inject viruses to go after bacteria. Um, and he could die from that if, if uh, you know, he had septic shock as a reaction to the phage, but he didn't. He woke up three days later, um, lifted his head off the pillow and kissed his daughter's hand. And he was up until that point had been within hours of dying. So um, it was a shock to everybody and a real miracle. And um, we feel really privileged because um, we had the resources and the connections to get people to help us. And the majority of people who are dying from superbug infections are in lower and middle income countries and don't have these resources. So we decided to write a, a book about our story um, to raise awareness called The Perfect Predator, A Scientist Race to Save Her Husband from a Deadly Superbug. And there it is. And um, we even have Hollywood interest. So we'll see what happens with that. But the main um, point now is that um, our story is not uh, in isolation. In fact, um, I now get phone calls and emails every single day from patients wow. around the world, including Canada. And now Canada has a, its own phage program called Phage Canada. And I'm thrilled that I was able to help advocate for that. That's amazing. Uh, what what an inspiring story. And, and also, um, as I said, you're fortunate to have the, the connections and the resources uh, and, and some of the questions we can talk about is, you know, how, how do we make this more widely available? Um, so, so as a segue, you know, we, we are marking World Endomicrobial Resistance Awareness Week. And so what are, what are the lessons that we can take from this experience that are important for us to be cognizant of during this particular week? Well, I think that most people living in North America think that antimicrobial resistance or the superbug crisis is something that happens to people over there in out of the way places, yeah. poor countries. And and yes, there are, you know, obviously a disproportionate burden of people living in lower and middle income countries that that um, acquire and die from superbug infections. But but my story is like a wake up call um, that, you know, I get calls from people like who stepped on a nail and now they have a bone infection that is not responding to antibiotics. And so, um, you know, and, and, you know, people with uh, chronic urinary tract infections that are no longer responding to antibiotics. And so it's, it's a worsening problem. It can happen to anybody and our misuse and overuse of antibiotics over the last several decades has what's got us into this mess. And, and you know, Canada is not um, an innocent partner in that either. Um, 80 percent of all antibiotics used in Canada are actually used in agriculture and in animal husbandry. And um, there's a lot of loopholes, even though there's a there's a ban in Canada and, and um, many countries to um, use um, antibiotics as growth promoters, but there's enough loopholes that it's still happening. Really? Okay. That's that's important to note then too. Um, and we, we talked about the One Health and to know that um, we really have to be vigilant in finding those ways to, um, to you know, reduce SNS as substantially the use. 
Um, so I personally have been interested in phage therapy for quite some time, and I know that it's sort of, I, I kind of liken it almost to a, a safety net for our system when we, we as a, we, we rely on uh, antibiotics so much, we need to have uh, these options. Uh, but something I've, I've noticed is that, you know, how do we make this more widely available? And, and you were you you were so informed, but you were also persistent. You were in terms of ensuring that this treatment would be available for your husband. There were a lot of moving parts and coordination to get the right care. And this is just you know one aspect that's involved in phage therapies, um, ensure, ensuring that it can be scalable and and widely used. Um, because I think we both know um, we're going to need this um, as a safety net, increasingly so. So so what do you think the steps that are required to ensure that phage therapy can really be there? as an alternative uh, for antimicrobials in, in health settings, um, I would say in the U.S., but also maybe Canada and, and abroad. And of course, when we're talking about LMICs, eventually, uh, you know, how, how can that be possible there as well? Well, whether we're talking about Canada, the U.S., or internationally, except for the countries like uh, Poland and um, mm -hmm. the Republic of Georgia, where phage is um, part of the standard of care and you can get over the counter without prescriptions, um, the rest of us really, you know, are facing severe bottlenecks. So one of the most important things that needs to happen are clinical trials. So we need to treat phage like living antibiotics. Um, they need to go through um, rigorous evaluation and clinical trials is, um, you know, the best scientific process to do that. Um, and that's going to take time. So it isn't just going to be one type of um, bacteria or one type of condition. It's going to have to be several. And that costs money and takes time. And people have to, um, you know, agree to, you know, uh, be participants. Um, so that's one thing. The second is that um, phage need to be matched to specific bacteria. It isn't like any phage will kill any bacteria. It's like a lock and key. So right now it's like having a million locks scattered all around the world and a million keys scattered all around the world. And you don't know where the keys are. You don't know where the locks are. You don't know which lock fits, which key, that kind of thing. So what we need is a phage library that's expansive because um, phage and bacteria have been duking it out for 4 billion years almost, and they're co-evolving. So it isn't like you could just create a phage library and then, you know, call it a day. It's these phage are, are evolving to attack bacteria and the bacteria are evolving to avoid the phage. So we need to ensure that we keep adding to the phage library. And so there are uh, phage libraries that exist um, in Canada and the US and internationally, but right now it's not centralized. Um, they're not characterized all in the same way. We need to have a database and bioinformatics. We need to know which phage go well together in a phage cocktail, because that's generally what's um, how they're used. We, we need to know which phage can be used best with which antibiotics, because mm. sometimes there's synergy between phage and antibiotics that can potentiate the use of both, but there can also be the opposite. Phage can actually um, have an antagonistic relationship with antibiotics. So you want to avoid those situations. So phage library is key. And then finally, we need um, GMP facilities. So it stands for good manufacturing practices. So we need to basically have giant bioreactors where you can grow phage up, clinical grade phage. And that's what we do with antibiotics. Um, right now, um, you know, phage are produced in ways sometimes that aren't clinical grade. And that's okay when you have a dying patient like my husband. But if it's going to be used for patients that don't have as serious infections, we're, we've got to make sure that they're as clean preparations as possible. So those are expensive. Wow. Um, do you think that the is is um you know from a clinical trial standpoint too is do you believe that there should be regulatory cooperation between regulatory agencies? Do you think that's an important step as well? Yes, I do. Um, certainly, um, each country has their own regulatory process for approving experimental drugs. Um, in the U.S., we have a compassionate use program. Um, so my husband's phage was approved through that program through what's called an EIND, standing for an emergency IND or investigational new drug. Um, so it was treated like a drug, even though it's a drug that was alive. Canada does not have a process by um, which they can approve phage like that, but um, um, Phage Canada is working with Health Canada to um, expedite um, you know, cases that can be approved for phage therapy. And the first two patients 
have received phage therapy and are doing really well. And I know a third is on its way and there's more. I mean, literally we've had more than 50 requests for phage therapy from Canada. Wow. And so that was one of the reasons why I said, you know, Canada, like a French Canadian discovered phage a hundred years ago, let's get with the program. And I wrote a, a, an op-ed in the Globe and Mail to kind of, you know, shake it, shake the tree. So, uh, but now it seems like there's a lot of interest and uh, the ball is rolling and uh, the uh, Phage Canada program is based at the University of Toronto under um, Dr. Greg German, who's doing an excellent job. Um, and they just received a $5 million gift from an anonymous donor. So they're, they're more well-resourced than our center in the U.S. So I'm really proud of that. Wow, that's 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 wonderful news. Um, it's obviously not one of those areas where you you want more patients because it's a, sig a signal of something. But but it's it's important to know that you know with that uh, that that in terms of uh, regulatory agencies in health Canada could be um, ideally set up. Uh, to review these applications. Um, well, your discussion of U of T and Dr. German is actually a good segue to my next question. So, you know, we at we at Cake we talk about uh, the need for incentives uh, to address the the gap in innovation with respect to antimicrobial uh, resistance, and we talk about in terms of pull policies, how we address the market gaps that exist, but also push policies in supporting R&D. And when we talk about the Canadian landscape and how Canada can make a difference uh, internationally in R&D, uh, something that comes up in conversations is phage therapy. And so, um, you know, there are researchers that are working on it and, and, and we talk about, you know, areas we can specialize. So, you know, could phage be an area where Canada could make its mark, um, both, of course, nationally, but also internationally in its contribution on, on the AMR front? Absolutely. I mean, I know a number of phage researchers um, in Ontario and Quebec and in Alberta and BC, and um, and there there's a growing interest in this area. And um, certainly what we've been discussing so far are natural phages. But um, genetically modified phages will have a, a, a role in the landscape as well, because sometimes the phage that we identify doesn't kill the bacteria or doesn't kill it efficiently. Mm -hmm. So we need to optimize the phage lifestyle and we can actually use genetic engineering to do that. So um, there are um, companies, um, one in particular in uh, Manitoba called Cytophage, that is um, working on synthetic phage uh, products. And they claim to be able to um, design a phage within 30 days of receiving the bacterial isolate. So, um, and I don't have any um, financial relationship with that company. So, but I'm very impressed with, um, with those efforts. So I think Canada can certainly take the lead. And in fact, researchers um, have been working on phage in Canada for decades and what they need are more resources and funding to be able to continue their work. Yeah, that's 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 great and great to note um, that those those opportunities are there and there are researchers doing interesting work that uh, require that level of support. Um, so my final question relates to uh, the G7. So Canada is, of course, a member of the G7 and AMR um, and addressing, um, you know, public or introducing public policies to incentivize innovation. In AMR has been a topic at the G7 in previous years. And Canada will be hosting uh, the G7 in 2025. And this provides a leadership opportunity for Canada in AMR. Um, and so as a Canadian, what do you think the steps uh, that Canada should take to ensure that um, AMR is a priority focus um, for the G7 and beyond? Well, I think sharing personal stories is important, um, like mine and others, so that people can realize that it is here and now. It isn't something that is... Um, in the past. I also think that um, there needs to be accountability because right now um, countries have by and large national action plans to address AMR. The U.S. has one, Canada has one, but there's no um, accountability. So there's no, nobody saying, hey, you have this as a goal to reduce the, you know, the percent of, you know, this particular organism that's um, found to be multi-drug resistant and you didn't meet that goal. So what are you gonna do to improve? Um, and so um, when we think of um, the agriculture and animal husbandry uh, industries like you know poultry and pork and beef, um, industries that Canada is very much involved in, there's that's where the majority of antibiotics are used um, in agriculture and 
on livestock. And so um, one of the loopholes that exists is that um, even though veterinarians have to prescribe antibiotics to an animal um, and they can't, farmers can't just give it willy nilly, there's no time limit on that. Um, so an animal could be receiving antibiotics for its entire life when it doesn't need it. So we need to make sure that medically uh, important antibiotics are not being used in the food chain, um, whether that's um, you know plants or animals, uh, because that's exactly how we got into this mess. I mean, the um, gene that confers resistance to the last resort antibiotic called colistin, um, that um, gene was discovered the, the year and the month that my husband fell ill and it was reported on by China. They had been feeding colistin to pigs mm -hmm. and other countries had stopped doing that. Um, but we can't blame China um, because uh, a lot of other countries are still doing that. And even though uh, China then put a ban on the use of colistin um, in the um, pork industry, they're still exporting it to other countries like Nigeria, Pakistan, Bangladesh. And of course, you know, that means that it's affecting all of us because we have migrants and visitors and a globalization and travel and all of these things, we're all connected. So it's important that um, we use this opportunity of the G7 to, to really have some hard and fast rules um, and that together we work um, to ensure that um, we make progress on AMR because the problem is getting worse and not better. Um, over 5 million people are dying every year due to AMR. And the, by the year 2050, it's estimated that one person every three seconds or 10 million people per year are going to be dying from superbug infections. So that's more than cancer, motor vehicle accidents, um, and more than HIV, TB, or malaria. So this is serious. It's here and now. And, and that's why my husband and I decided to tell our story to make it real. Well, thank you so much for telling your story. It is about the it is about the personal stories that we hope will um, have an impact, um, have wider awareness amongst the public, and also encourage, as you said, that that oversight and accountability that's required um, with these action plans. We're very grateful that Canada has issued the Pan Canadian Action Plan, and and we we do recognize this is a first step in uh, of many that are required to protect our population and the world um, from this um, very. Uh, a concerning threat, I would say, to put it mildly. Um, so Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us for this podcast and for all the work that you're doing, you and your husband, um, to raise awareness and to contribute to this research space. Um, we will include information about uh, your book and Beige Canada and some of these others in our uh, show notes. And um, hopefully uh, we'll see each other in person sometime soon. Great. Thanks so much, Danny. Thank you so much.